But overall, I would say like the biggest negative effect that we saw was the drop in milk protein, just because almond holes have, you know, very, very little, you know, three, 4% protein in them. So you do have to take that into consideration. If you're feeding on a higher inclusion rate, you're going to have to throw something like soybean meal or canola meal in to really help bring that protein percent up. And that does cost a little bit more. Um, So I think keeping it around 10 to 15 percent is very reasonable and it can actually help to improve the milk fat percent. So you kind of have that trade off where you can get a little more milk fat, but you might see a little bit of a dip in milk protein. I'm the host of the Dairy uh, Dairy Nutrition Black Belt podcast. My guest today is Dr. Katie Swanson. Uh, she's a, a lecturer, dairy lecturer in dairy science and management at Cal Poly. She did a lot of work, some of her graduate work and a postgraduate work at UC Davis, studying uh, byproducts. And one of her emphasis was on almond hulls. So, Katie, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me, Dr. Weiss. I'm really excited to be here today. Again, you've done a lot of work. I've read several papers on almond hulls. They've been fed for a very long time. So why the the new interest in all the the work in almond hulls? Sure. So almonds, um, California is the biggest producer of almonds in the entire world. We produce about 80% of the world's almonds. And about 50% of the weight coming off of those trees is the almond hulls. So just for reference, we have you know billions of pounds of almond holes being produced in California every year. So we were approached by the Almond Board of California um, back in 2017 or 2018 to look at seeing how much almond holes we could feed to dairy cattle. Um, at the time, I think the current inclusion rate for dairies in California was around two to three pounds, depending. Uh, So they wanted to see kind of how high we could go before we started to have negative effects on production for high producing cows. Uh, So we did a study looking at feeding up to 20% of their diet or about uh, 12 pounds of almond holes per cow and didn't really have a lot of negative effects except for milk protein. For for the Midwesterners in the audience, give us a brief overview of the nutritional value of, of, of typical almond holes. So almond holes are a great fiber source, um, but they're not a great substitute for something like alfalfa fiber because they do have a relatively high lignin. So they are comparable for NDF content, but higher in the lignin, so less digestible fiber. Um, But they're fantastic for their um, fermentable sugars. So they're about 60% non-fiber carbohydrates. So in our study, we actually decided to use them as a concentrate substitute instead of a fiber substitute. And if and again, I've only seen them a few times when I'm out in California, but they're they're the particle sizes are usually pretty big, so the cows have to chew them too. I mean, it's not like soy hulls, for example, what we're we're used to. Yeah, they're actually likened to like the flesh of a peach, so they are somewhat uh, flexible, kind of soft, so it's not difficult for the cows to chew them. But they are in general about an inch long or so, so they're not super fine. Um, I will say in general, cows do like them, but of course you have some cows that will sort them out, but overall, it seems like they like them. Since, you know, these are a byproduct and quality control varies among producers of the byproduct. What are some potential quality issues with, with almond hulls? Sure. A big one is going to be what we've been referring to as the debris um, so like the, the one of the papers that we did, we were looking at uh, digestibility for what we called commercial almond holes. So that was all the almond holes with any sticks or shells or dirt in there. And then we hand sorted out all of the debris and had just pure holes that we were looking at. And so you do have, you know, lower digestibility, lower energy values when you leave in those sticks and shells because they're not really offering any nutrition. Um, so that's always a concern, you know, when, you, when you're buying holes in California, they, they'll usually call them prime holes and those are going to be less than 15% crude fiber, but are we always yeah. testing regularly? <laughs> Maybe not so much. And so that's definitely something that dairy producers need to kind of keep an eye on is when they're getting a load of almond holes, is it really full of sticks and shells? Cause that's just not adding any value. Or if, if they wanted to buy them with specs or something, you'd look at crude fiber 
which again, no one out here measures and, yeah. and anything else other than crude fiber. Could we use NDF or ADF as a quality indicator? It is funny because the almond industry is very stuck on crude fiber. And so the California Department of Food and Ag, whenever they do any inspections, they're just looking at crude fiber. Of course, nutritionists, we want to know NDF content. Exactly. Um, so we did have a lot of different values for samples that we collected throughout California. So we do have some NDF and lignin estimates for those. Um, but yeah, generally when you're buying, it's just to be based off of crude fiber and you kind of have to just go a lot off of appearance. And of course, we do always have to check for mold as well. The, the holes being um, somewhat dry and kind of porous, they can take in a lot of moisture. So if they're not being stored properly, there is that potential for mold growth. Uh, we don't want to talk about specific feed costs because they vary so much geographically. Yeah. But if, say, relative to corn or relative to a common feed, how, how would you price almond holes? Well, I know right now they're about 200 or so dollars a ton. And so that's, that's gone up drastically. Like when we first started doing this in 2018, they were right around a hundred dollars a ton. So they've definitely increased in value um, over the years. And I think that it kind of just comes down to, you know, weather and shipping costs, um, whether or not it's a good deal compared to something like corn. Um, we have a lot of other concentrate byproducts in California, but I think relative to other byproducts that we have for how highly fermentable the almond holes are, and like they are a good source of energy and sugars and those, you know, easily fermentable carbohydrates, they, they do make a great feed for the price. So the, you, if you're feeding this, it's uh, substitution isn't necessarily corn. It would be other byproducts or how would you price this? Rel again, I don't want a specific price, but just relative, would you compare it to the price of corn or to the multitude of byproducts you have available out there. Yeah, I would probably compare it to the price of corn. Okay. At Aseo, a global leader in nutritional solutions and the provider of Smartamine M, the best in-class rumen protected methionine product for dairy producers who want to optimize milk production, capture more value from their components, and maintain the lifetime performance of their herds. For more product information and to calculate your return on investment when you balance your feed with amino acids, go to milkpay.com. Is there interest? You know, I know it's kind of light. The density isn't real. It isn't a real dense product. Is there interest in shipping it east to the, the dairy industries? You know, maybe not all the way to the Midwest, but Idaho and elsewhere. Yeah, I think that they are now doing some shipments to Texas. That's what I've heard. But we, we had actually worked a little bit with the Almond Board of California as well, talking about the potential to pellet the almond holes to make them more dense so they'd be more cost effective for shipping. Um, and I actually did another study recently, it's not published yet, with um, Dr. Dan Putnam, where we were looking at cubing almond holes with lower quality alfalfa as a potential um, export product. And so there's definitely that potential for export on the horizon. I know the almond board is very interested in getting the holes out of California because we're just not physically able to feed all of them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, I do think a lot of producers outside of California are not super aware of almond holes. So I think it would take, you know, kind of a slow start getting that demand out there, but they are definitely a valuable feed. It's just, yeah, with the, the low density, it's really hard to ship them and make that cost effective. Well, lastly here, you started, you said your studies were up to, you went up to 20%. Mm -hmm. um, is that the optimal or if you were, would you, you can feed that much or would you recommend in most cases lower concentrations or is there an optimal concentration? Yeah, I think we kind of had some weird results too, where we had a bit of a quadratic effect. So we had almost better data at the 7% inclusion and 20% inclusion than the 13% inclusion. So that was kind of odd. Um, but overall, I would say like the biggest negative effect that we saw was the drop in milk protein, just because almond holes have, you know, very, very little, you know, three, 4% protein in them. So you do have to take that into consideration. If you're feeding on a higher inclusion rate, you're going to have to throw something like soybean meal or canola meal in to really help bring that protein percent up. And that does cost a little bit more. Um, so I think keeping it around 
10 to 15% is very reasonable and it can actually help to improve the milk fat percent. So you kind of have that trade off where you can get a little more milk fat, but you might see a little bit of a dip in milk protein. And with, with the price of milk fat right now, that wouldn't be a bad compromise. Yeah. Oh, uh, like I said, I learned a lot. I, I never knew much about almond hulls. I've enjoyed, enjoyed this uh, discussion. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me.